Hello and good morning, everybody. My name is David Anu, and let me welcome you on behalf of the other presenters as well. Uh, and uh, I will start uh, with the first talk, but first a quick general introduction about this webinar. Uh, the main goal of the session is to showcase approaches that greatly simplify the work of uh, data analysts when performing data analytics or when employing machine learning algorithms over big data. This webinar is co-organized by the research project InForest, Smart Data, data Lake, and Extreme Earth. And with that, I will start with the first uh, presentation about Infora. My talk will be about graphical data analytics and workflows uh, and uh, cross-platform optimization. So, it's about the, the project I'm talking about is called Infore, short for Interactive Extreme Scale Analytics and Forecasting. And what is uh, the general overview and the goal of our project? So we want to design data processing workflows in a graphical way so that data analytics tasks can be used without or only minimal programming overhead. What we want to do with that is we want to achieve real-time interactive machine learning and data mining and also distributed complex event forecasting. And we're not doing this only um, for our own, but we work closely with three very interesting use cases, which I will quickly present you because it's not the main agenda of this talk. But the first use case is about life science. Uh, life science. And here we are working on studying the effects of drugs in, and drug synergies in cancer. And we're doing this in a silico simulation. So we have huge supercomputers. The supercomputer center in Barcelona is one of our partners. And there we are simulating the individual growth and reaction of tumor cells, um, uh, how they react on, uh, on medications and different drugs. And these are really huge simulations and, 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 and very important research. But the challenge is that it's a huge amount of data uh, and, and CPU time that is, is, uh, is required. And of the, those many simulations, only a few run are promising. And it's really hard to, to um, shift through all, through all these kinds of data and see which one are the promising ones and perhaps stop the non-promising one quite early to save a lot of simulation time to speed up the, the research and get interesting results faster. The other use case is about finance data. And here we want to predict price ranks and anal uh, analyze systematic risks and perhaps do also forecasting on investment opportunities. And as you can imagine, this is also a huge amount of data that comes in very fast, and we want not only uh, analyze single um, um, stock data or single time cross, but we want to do it on a high dimensional level, viewing patterns and correlations between di very different um, um, market um, shareholders and, and, and see how the market reacts uh, in a really fast way. And the third use case is about maritime uh, traffic monitoring. So we are working here with um, Marine Traffic, a big comp a company that is providing a monitoring service for uh, maritime traffic. And we want to monitor uh, ship movement and especially detect illegal activities such as ship uh, fishing in areas where it's not allowed, piracy, and, and things like that. And the challenge here is that we have data coming in from a lot of different sources, like local data from underwater uh, monitoring systems, sonar, microphones, and so on, um, land-based um, um, and um, surface-based um, monitoring, and of course, global satellite positioning data and space monitoring for, via satellite. And the challenge here is that we have a large amount of data because we have many ships to monitor. Uh, Okay. We have a lot of different data sources available, as mentioned, and the actual event that we want to detect is uh, classified because it's not a single binary decision. There's not a flag, okay, this is a pirate activity or not, or this is a fishing activity. 
but we have to extract these patterns out of the ship movement, of the, of the past behavior of the ship, and so on. So this is quite complex to, to detect those things. So this is background on the technical side, on, on the use case side, what we want to do. And now I will go a bit and, and show how we do this in a technical level. So what we have achieved so far in this project. So we at Rapid Miner, we have built a graphical data analytics workflow that works with Spark Streaming and Flink. And what we have here is we have a graphical editor. That is a typical work approach from Rapid Miner, how we design also um, data analytics and machine learning processes. And we have adopted that for uh, streaming analytics. So what you see here is a really an actual screenshot of the, the Rapid Miner workflow designer. And we see here as a new feature, the streaming nest inside and inside which we will build the, the streaming analytics workflow. So we define a, a connection to which cluster we want to, or which what cluster we want to connect. Inside we define from where we want to retrieve the data, typically coming from a Kafka um, topic provider. Uh, they retrieve, retrieve the data from the different topics and we can perform typical analytics um, tasks such as filtering, mapping keys to another value, and of course joining streams and perform some aggregations on that and then write back. So it's a very quite simple and quick um, method to um, design these analytics workflows and upon execution one job is created that is then executed on a specific cluster. How does it work on a technical level? So we see the, the representation inside Rapid Miner Studio with the operators that you can click the, uh, easily drag and drop and, and connect. Um, behind then it is um, translated, visual in, uh, representation is translated into a framework independent graph that is a general description about this workflow. And from that independent graph it is then specifically translated into the specific um, graph for the different clusters. So for example, Spark or Flink. And uh, yeah, what we, can, what we have achieved so far, we, have, we are supporting Apache Flink and Apache uh, Structured Streaming. We have already several um, operations available, like typical streaming analytics operations. We have a connection to quite powerful Synopsis data engine that is, um, performing more advanced uh, calculations on, on the streaming data, on the incoming data. We have connections to custom online machine learning engines that are running on Flink and Akka. And we already have some then connections to financial service providers that we can also collect the data. What are the benefits of this approach in this workflow? So for, first of all, it is a code-free development. So you don't have to write specific code uh, in, a, in a language like Java, Scala, or what is it, or, or Spark uh, to, to design your workflows. And as you have seen, uh, because we are using Rapid Miner as a front end, it's completely independent of the back end. So we can easily switch out the um, underlying cluster and the underlying back end. Um, another nice feature is we have a pluggable connection management. So all the connections information to which cluster we want to collect from which um, Kafka data provider we want to um, collect the data. This is all manageable via this connection object and they can be easily plugged out. So it's more or less one simple operation, for example, to switch from a staging environment to a productive environment and back and forth. So this is really easy. And because we have this independent uh, representation, these processes can also easily share and, uh, with other colleagues and other, and other working on other systems or even via Rapid Miner Server and AI Hub, you can collaborate um, together on designing these workflows. Um, so uh, if you want to look a bit more because time is quite short, um, we have, oops, it's not showing, I will post it in the chat later. Here we have a, we have a YouTube video um, where uh, it's presenting a bit more in details how it's really executed, what is working in behind. I'm not sure why the link is not showing here. I will post it in the chat uh, after my presentation. So 
what we want to do is not only about having a single graphical workflow, but we want to also have customization. And as you see here, we now have another connection between Spark Streaming and Fling, and we have a new component, the optimizer. And what this optimizer is doing, we start um, if you have a multi-setup, we have several clusters available in a huge infrastructure. Um, the optimal execution can depend on different, uh, on different um, aspects. For example, of obviously, what resources are available, how many nodes each cluster has, how many memory is available, how many uh, CPUs are available, how many diff uh, parallel tasks can be executed. And of course, where the data is located. Does not make sense if we have a very fast cluster, but the data has first shipped via uh, internet to it. So we have a large lag on, on the data transfer, uh, for the data transferring. It's probably not as feasible. And of course, there are always software performances and implementation details. Some operations might run faster on, on different backends or specific operations might only be available on different backends. So overall, an optimized process layout and the pr optimal Backend exchange between different clusters can greatly enhance the, the performance of such, such a workflow. And how we can do this? Um, as you see here, we have a file layout as before, but a small different change. So example here, we have now the streaming optimization. I have to rush a bit because time is running short already. And we define different backends. Now we have here a Flink execution backend and a Spark execution backend. And this layout then is sent over to the optimizer. Um, and the optimizer gives us a response. So it says, okay, put these um, execution tasks uh, on the Flink uh, platform and these operations on the, on the Spark platform. And with that, the, um, the workflow is split uh, at that point. And then we have two new executions. One, uh, one um, nest for the Flink execution and one for the Spark execution. And inside the same operations apply. So okay, here we apply the, the filtering and the join of the stream from uh, uh, on Flink, but the mapping is done on on, uh, on Spark. And in the end, here again we have this Kafka sync and this Kafka source. They are interconnected. So the data coming out of this cluster and this um, operation comes in here for the join on on the Flink. And the results we come to a, an optimized workflow in the end. So the conclusion so far, what I have presented to you is we have seen the three very interesting use cases we are working on, maritime data, finance data, and the life science use case of the cancer research. You have seen the first version of the graphical editor, how you can design and manage um, streaming analytics workflow with a very easy user interface. And you have seen how we can perform cross-platform optimization. So of course, the project started last year, so we're not yet done. We have a lot of things to do and a lot of very good ideas what we want to implement next. So what we are doing is, and currently working on is a better job and data monitoring. So we want to see actually what is doing, uh, what we are doing and what's happening on the streams. Also, um, to scale up um, live the um, demands on the cluster, we want to have a better and tighter integration with the high performance computing systems that are run uh, for the simulation, uh, especially for the cancer simulation. So, we have an interconnectivity there, uh, or a tighter interconnectivity there. And of course, we want to do some refinements and deployment of the actual use cases. So, we want to see some good results here, but we are very convinced that this will work. And for that, my uh, 15 minutes are already over. So thank you a lot. And um, now I will hand over to, it's my pleasure to hand over to Miguel, who will talk about data virtualization and the Smart Data Lake project. Okay, so thank you so much. Let me just share my screen. Uh, 
Okay, so thank you so much and thank you for, thank you all for joining. <clears throat> so I'll be talking um, a little bit about the Smart Italic project <clears throat> and, in, and in particular I'll be focusing one of the components of it, sort of more the foundation, one of the foundational layers of the project. Um, and uh, also try to keep my talk short, try to get go a bit through a demo, just to give you an idea of what the project is exactly about. So Smart Data Lake is about building sustainable data lakes for extreme scale analytics. And there's many parts to it, right? So at the foundational level, uh, there's a component about data virtualization uh, over data lakes, um, trying to remove many of the hurdles uh, and the complexity in managing data and building and maintaining data lakes. Um, from there on, you have tools that focus on exploration analysis of heterogeneous information networks, and then on top, uh, you even have the interactive visual analytics and a lot of focus on spatial, temporal, and graph data. Now, there's many partners in the project, and uh, the part that I'm going to be focused on today is the, let's call the lower level building blocks, which is data virtualization over data lakes. Now, this is a, this, this component is, is actually a joint um, endeavor by two partners with EPFL, the Ecole Polytechnique Federal Lausanne, and uh, a private company called Raw Labs, which is uh, where I'm associated with. That said, there's a very tight relationship between the two. Uh, just a word on Raw Labs. Uh, Raw Labs is a spin off from EPFL, uh, so that's where the connection comes from. Um, and Raw Labs, as a company, we are working on digital transformation and providing data management tools. Uh, and the idea, and that's why we're contributing to this project is what we're providing. We're building a query engine that's providing instant real-time and transparent querying integration of data lakes and operational databases. So that's where the virtualization component that I, that I talked about uh, comes in and that's where it starts building, uh, becoming important. Now, our product is called RAW uh, and that's a, that's a data management platform. <clears throat> and the idea is that we want to provide data engineers, data scientists, data analysts, so very much across the, the full stack, uh, this seamless querying uh, over operational data sources in real time and transform them into new data sets for consumption by upstream tools, with analytics tools, ML models, and enterprise applications. So that's just giving you the context. And now I'll be focusing more uh, on what we're doing also in the context of Smart Data Lake and how we, we, we come in. And I'll be just showing you some examples on how we are using raw, our query engine, to query raw data using a SQL-like language. So why do we do that? Well, managing raw data is hard. And uh, even the previous speaker mentioned many of the problems, but you know, conceptually, it's, raw data can be very big. It's often machine generated. Uh, you can have many diverse data sources, you can have millions of files, directories, or you can have data that's outside the data lake on operational databases. Those ones can be very hard as well. It's also very complex, mostly because the operations we want to do on, on raw data, um, you know, range from simple business reporting uh, that may require some data cleaning to some very complex CTL tasks, and of course, you know, machine learning and so forth. There's also many types of data. That's actually something that, that is key to what we are doing at RAW. And a lot of the motivation behind building a new query engine uh, is that we have many different types of data. We have, you know, we have the simple ones, the tabular data, but we have JSONs that can be very complex. We have XMLs that can be extremely complex. We have machine logs, we have time series, we have all types of data. and. Uh, a lot of our work has been in, in coping with this type of data and building a rich data model uh, that can support it. And of course, we want it to work pretty much in real time, uh, where we want sort of instant results with no preparation time. And all of these points come together because a lot of these processes involve many iterations. ETL, machine learning is a typical example. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of complexity in iterating, discovering which data you have preparing it and then trying to derive a meaningful result and then going back in the loop because something was missing or some data source was missing or a new data set is available now and then you have to go back and of course you want to do all of this in real time um, and uh, you know the many of these challenges uh, just require in our opinion a new design a new approach and that's what we're focusing on 
so what is raw at a very conceptual level the idea is that we provide a single platform uh, that would you know logically unify these data sources uh, and the idea is to provide powerful queries and data manipulations within one language and that's the key is that one language aspect um, so for this idea is that you don't have to do a previous step where you have to do some etl some extract transform loads or in the case of data lakes the elt where you extract loads and then transform the data lake uh, the idea is that you don't really have to do data copies explicitly into a data lake for instance uh, and of course you want to provide that one language so that you don't have to use many different tools uh, and you know many different scripts and then which then complicates tracking provenance between all of them for instance um, then of course plug and play and about supporting many uh, data formats as i mentioned before and then of course once you have that platform it's much easier to to build higher level tools on top so i'll just switch a little bit to a demo to to show you what this is about concretely um, and just give me a second yeah i believe you can see my screen so let me so i've decided that I think it would be in the interesting of, of everyone because when we often talk about raw, it uh, seems somewhat in an abstract term. So I decided just to show you some examples uh, of how it can be used. And these examples in this case are, are, are somewhat artificial, but the, the point here is to illustrate the power of the engine, its capabilities, uh, and, uh, you know, and the query language, that's being a, a very important part of it. And then you can extrapolate the use cases, right? Uh, so in, in this example, so these are Jupyter notebooks. Uh, if you're familiar, familiar with them, um, they are quite common in, in data analytics. And you know, all we are doing the first line is just enabling the Jupyter client to draw. So they are called magics in Jupyter. It's just just the way you you enable extensions in these Jupyter notebooks. Now the other point I want to make is that these Jupyter notebooks, what you see here, is the whole process. Like every notebook, I could pass it to you, and assuming you have the client configured pointing to an instance of raw, that's all there is. There is no other process involved. I'm not, there's no process that's, that hasn't been described here. In fact, you see it here because in the first step we're registering an S3 bucket. We need to just give it the credentials. Uh, and it actually you knows flagging me an error that credentials already exist because I've ran this notebook in the past. So the system already knows about the credentials. That's why it's just telling me that it's not needed. And then the first query I'm doing, uh, this percent uh, percent percent query is just the Jupyter notebook tag to, to to call an extension. I'm doing it with XML, and this doesn't look at all like a, a query language you know, but it will get more familiar in a second. And we are reading an XML file from uh, an S3 bucket, and actually I have the XML file here, so it's a fairly complex structure. Uh, and and the system will just read it and render it to you, and you know has some rendering but it's able to read it and there was no schema I mean, there's no schema creation it, it's automatically inferred and it's available for you to query now the the key point is that that query language we're building is sql compatible so there are extensions like i'm showing you here and i'm showing more below but the idea is that it is backward compatible to a very large extent to, to sql um, and a lot of what we do is provide extensions and new capabilities. And I'm giving you an example. So this data set, I uh, should have mentioned that, comes from um, uh, work we've done in the past uh, with a use case in the medical sector. So this was actually information coming from a custom system in the medical sector where they were tracking how much time nurses were uh, spending with patients. Uh, and in terms of medications they were giving and so forth. So if you're giving that, you have a question such as, you know, how much time did the nurse pass with a specific patient? Um, and you could see some, you know, in other systems, some sort of complexity involved in answering this question, but it's pretty straightforward in raw. So it's just assignment operator where we say patients is just that read XML file, just so that we can refer it more, uh, uh, more succinctly. Otherwise you could just see read XML here as well. Uh, we, do, we go through the item and then we go through the chart based nursing reports item, which you see here, chart based nursing reports item. This is a nested list. Uh, and we have various extensions to the data model and the query language so that we can support nested structures. Uh, and then we're able to group by name and surname uh, of the patient. We project the surname and we send the total minutes. And that's it, right? So. Uh, those are the patients and how much time each nurse spent with them. 
Similarly, right, we can do queries over CSV files. And again, we just do read command. The read is the most automatic uh, form of inference. Read XML, at least hints the system it's an XML file. Read, you can point it anywhere else. Uh, it will figure out if it's XML, CSV, a database system, whatever it is, and it's going to find the scheme as well and then make it available for you. Uh, and then in this case, we're actually picking up the CSV file and we're actually grouping uh, into a nested record with a category of diagnosis and a list of descriptions. So this is something that goes beyond the scope of SQL because we're actually, this query produces a hierarchical output where you have a category of a disease and the number of cases and the description of the, of the actual uh, diagnosis uh, uh, based on that category. And then we're actually able to join both of these data sets, one on diagnosis and one on patients, and then you know provide uh, uh, extracting the patient ages to generate a distribution for a certain type of disease. And this is all done in this language, which again, some extensions are available here, but our experience is that for somebody who's familiar with SQL, it's very easy to get started uh, once you learn the few extensions that there are. And Again, highlighting what you don't have to do, which is discovering schemas, copying data, and so forth. Uh, Raw will be discovering those. We'll be bringing the data in and caching it if we think that's appropriate and necessary. Uh, it will be maintaining those caches. It will be refreshing them with new data, and all of that is managed for you. Uh, so just enabling data scientists or data engineers to focus on their task at hand and their queries uh, and not worry about the rest. Uh, a few more examples where we do similar things. Uh, and just for the interest of time, I might just pass on to one that involves more machine learning integration. Uh, where similarly we pick up a diabetes data set, which is a very complex one, uh, about we're going to use it as a training set and figuring out if the BMI is a good indication to, to, to try on to know if the, the the patient is likely to have diabetes. Uh, and you know, the first query as often we do is just read the file. I could do select star, but it's not necessary because it's the same thing in our syntax. Just had an issue with the expansion here. That's fine. And here we are uh, going through that file, extracting the BMI, which is actually a nested array uh, from the training data, and we output a record. So this this is again way beyond traditional SQL. The output of this query is a record where uh, the first uh, column is you know, one element and the second column is the training target. And we, this is sort of, you are preparing a training data set by, by, by parsing the, the, the raw data. And this is just doing the same thing in, using Python directly, right? So you just import the raw client and you do that query. Uh, and the, the data set, the output of this query uh, is directly translated into a Python dictionary. So it's a very seamless transition with a destination target language. Uh, where, for instance, here we produce that query produces a record called Xtrain uh, with a column called Xtrain and an attribute called Ytrain. And you can access them in Python just like this. Uh, and here we're calling, we're using scikit-learn uh, to do a regression fit uh, using those two uh, those two variables and uh, you know very again very easy transition and the inference and there's many steps involved in, in the in the background to get this done once that's trained we actually publish a model into a component of raw where the model is made persistent um, and just just in the interest of just showing the capabilities of the system we actually then do a query uh, in raw um, that the query itself calls a Python function. So we can call directly Python and Java and Scala from within a query, sort of pushing down the computation to the nodes holding the data. Uh, and that, you know, that piece of Python code is actually retrieving the model we just published before and running a prediction function uh, and picking up, you know, a bunch of data and calling that prediction function. And, you know, there's a, a few steps involved here, but the basic idea is that we have you know, the Python function that takes two arguments, a data set with a collection of collection of doubles and the name of the model and returns an array of doubles. So you sort of see the, the ability of the, of the query engine uh, and of the data model in terms of supporting many data types, complex data types, multidimensional arrays, uh, and still bringing it into a, a language that by and large in, in many of its aspects resembles a lot, of, a lot like SQL. Um, and you know, once we, once we're done that, we again uh, retrieve, create a record as an output with features, target, and prediction, assign it to a Python variable called test, 
which we then just use a, a plotting tool uh, just to plot it and that's it so this just show showing you the steps involved right and and making sure people are focusing on the data wrangling on the on the data management parts and and uh, not on the rest um and i think for the interest of time i might just uh, stop here right and uh, we can always follow up um but just to give you an overview of what was happening here right so i was showing you a very brief demo uh, of raw and focusing very much on the query language uh, and raw is very much a turnkey solution and the idea is that we want to deliver you know a query engine that's capable of executing batch queries uh, which i showed to some extent we also have extensions for streaming queries uh, a key factor is this support for multiple data models. So while SQL is typically seen as, as a tabular for tabular data, and there's a few systems with extensions for some hierarchical structures, but those are, I mean, are quite limited in practice. And there's always some form of ETL that you have to do uh, if you're past more complex data structures or the performance is not going to be there or the query language is very awkward and so forth. And uh, we've been extending it for supporting tables, uh, trees, which I showed to some extent, arrays, matrices, multidimensional matrices, and so forth, and bringing that into a, you know, a SQL language on steroids, with a, which is still a declarative, pure functional language, but with many of these extensions. Uh, multiple support for native file formats and CSVs, JSONs, XMLs. Uh, we also have examples on querying operational databases, Postgres, MySQL, DB2, Oracle, Teradata, and so forth. Uh, the language also has multiple extensions for common ETL functionality and even some data cleaning operations. And behind the back, behind all this, is a, an engine uh, working in a, focusing on automatic, automatic creation and management of indexes and caches. So this is something you never have to do explicitly. Uh, it's a feedback-based approach. You start by asking queries to the system and the system is going to figure out how to load, ingest, cache that data in its internal caches based on the types of questions being asked. So that was the initial research insight into building this system is that we often do it the other way around. We look at what the DBA thinks your system is going to need or the queries are going to be like, and then you start creating indexes. Uh, well, this is then the other way around. You receive the query, and then as we are going to the source and retrieving the data, we decide how best to store it columnar format, row format, or something else uh, based on what's being asked. And this extended SQL-like query language, which we think is, is easy to learn, and then, of course, provide this into a platform uh, that's scalable, that give, gives a performance, that's secure, and that's easy to use. And uh, just, you know, I'll be available for more questions. I, I, I think at this point, I'll take advantage to hand over to Theophilus. And thank you so much. So thank you, Miguel, uh, for the introduction. And hello, everyone. Let me share my screen. So let's see. So I hope everyone can see my screen now. Um, so yeah, uh, to, uh, today we will talk about, uh, in this presentation, uh, about ex uh, the Extreme Earth project, uh, uh, Horizon 2020 project, and in particular Hopsworks, a component, let's say, a, a platform that is uh, made available and it's being also developed as part of the Extreme Earth project that uh, can do data intensive uh, analytics uh, with deep learning uh, and Earth observation data. So first, we will talk a bit about what, extreme, what the Extreme Earth project is about. And uh, the it, it, Extreme Earth project is about extracting knowledge and information from Earth observation data, and in particular, Copernicus Big Data that is made available by, by the EU. And it, uh, Copernicus data effectively is satellite uh, data that is made available to data scientists and uh, engineers uh, across the world. And the important thing here about Extreme Earth is the scale that uh, we need to go to, to process huge amounts of data 
to extract the knowledge by using deep learning techniques and geospatial analytics. So as we can see here on this slide, uh, we're talking about petabytes, like hundreds of petabytes of data that is made uh, accessible by the Copernicus Open Access Hub. Uh, so we're talking about quite a bit of data and also new data that is coming in uh, continuously. So we see that uh, every day we have uh, about uh, 93 terabytes that is being disseminated. And the important thing here is, okay, we have all this data, but the value that we can extract from all this data, and we can see at the at the last bullet point. Uh, so Extreme Earth goes beyond the current state of the art in doing processing for big data and in particular Earth observation data. So the goal is to develop Extreme Earth analytics techniques and technologies that can scale to the petabytes of the data that is available. So we want to make uh, as, the, as best use uh, out of this data as possible. So here we see a list of partners and the link also to the project. Now, the project uh, focuses on two use cases uh, mostly. Uh, these are the uh, food security use case and the polar uh, use case, uh, the polar tap and food security tap, the thematic exploitation platforms. That means that the data we're working with, uh, examples of use cases could be food irrigation, so satellite images uh, view uh, food crops and uh, we want to get insights about food crops and food irrigation. Or for example, in the, in the Arctic region, we want to do uh, some uh, iceberg uh, detection, so for ships to be able to avoid icebergs while navigating across the Arctic. Now, to do all this, the data scientists uh, of the project need to have a platform, a software platform, where they can uh, process and apply their deep learning and geospatial analytics uh, techniques. And this platform needs to be able to scale to the petabytes of data that is available. So this platform is Hopsworks, uh, developed by Logical Clocks, the, the part, one of the partners in the project. And to the rest of the presentation will take you through how Hopsworks can simplify the, all the tasks that data scientists and data engineers need to do in order to go from the raw data, with, uh, I'm taking it from the previous presentation now, the raw data, which is very, very important, and taking it to the next uh, level, let's say, of extracting like knowledge out of it by applying different techniques. So yeah, this is some of the management team and some awards that the platform has won, mostly for scalability and e uh, like ease of use, let's say. Now, the, uh, what we want to achieve here uh, in the Extreme F project and with Hopsworks in general is to provide uh, a way to data scientists and engineers to focus on the tasks they mostly care about, they mostly want to spend their time on. So you can see here, this is from a Netflix presentation, it's quite interesting. You see in the middle the stack of technologies that are typically used in order to do machine learning operations, MLOps as they are called lately. That means that you need to have a data warehouse to store all your data, then you need to have a compute engine to process the data, you need to schedule it, you need to version your data so you can go back in time and uh, check out, as we say, the data that you want. You need collaborative tools such as Jupyter Notebooks, which is all, was also demoed in the previous presentation. Uh, and then go in model uh, deployment and really machine learning uh, focused tasks. But as we can see, the infrastructure that is needed uh, at the bottom layer to process and manage the data and version the data is a lot more than uh, what a typical data scientist uh, cares about. So a platform should really make it easy for data scientists and engineers to focus on the tasks they care about and the platform should, should manage all the other things, all the uh, data management layer, let's say, and the ML ops. Now, Hopsworks is a platform that does that, also as part of the Extreme Earth project, where you can input uh, data from different data sources. Uh, and these data sources uh, can be, for example, uh, in, in this case, are satellite images coming from satellite uh, from the Copernicus program. But it can also be different kinds of uh, input data, like uh, uh, data from the web, from uh, click-through rates you get, or, or tweets you can process, uh, sens uh, sensor data from different devices, etc. Then you have the platform where you manage and process uh, all these things. And then at the end, you have the applications that can make use of the platform to, to build their own uh, applications on top of uh, Hopsworks. There's a different technologies that we use. Uh, some of them were mentioned in the, also in the previous presentations, such as Kafka and Spark and Flink. But as you can see, uh, Hopsworks uh, covers all the, um, 
all the range, let's say, from data preparation to experimentation to deployment, uh, all different technologies. Now, uh, let's focus now on the machine learning pipeline and what this is, because we mentioned before about ML ops, so we want data scientists to focus on their tasks. What are these tasks really? So here you can see an end-to-end -end machine learning pipeline, which means that you get the data into the platform. This is platform agnostic, let's say. Most of the platforms do that, and then we can focus on OPSOX as well. So you ingest the data, in this case, satellite data, and then you want to do your feature engineering. You want to extract features. Features are, let's say, the attributes of your data that you want to engineer on and then eventually do your machine learning on. So you do the machine learning part in the experiments uh, part of this uh, pipeline in the middle. And then at the end, after you have done the experiments, the machine learning experiments, you have developed a model, you need to make it available to other applications into production and put it into production. So uh, there are tools there that uh, help you in Hopsworks in the platform to do that. So this is the entire, let's say, pipeline. From feature engineering, feature selection, train, machine learning, training, developing the model effectively, and serving the model, and also allowing the applications to send the requests to the model. Now, this slide shows in particular what kind of technologies we use, and we touched a bit upon that. So all the technologies we use are open source, and Hopsworks itself is also open source. So uh, this means it's free to use, and uh, you can just download and install. Uh, so you can see here that uh, we can ingest data from different sources, as we said, uh, from the Copernicus Hub. Uh, you can also get sources from different object stores in the cloud, uh, different vendors such as Amazon, uh, Google Cloud, uh, Google Cloud, etc. Then you can process that with Apache Spark or Flink, and uh, do your feature engineering with the Hopsworks feature store. That is a key part of the pipeline. Then you can do your machine learning with different popular uh, machine learning frameworks. The most popular ones, TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Scikit-Learn, which was also demoed before. And, and then you can do model serving, and Hopsworks supports that with uh, technologies such as Kubernetes and Docker, and Kafka for ingesting data and also monitoring the model. And you orchestrate that with Apache Airflow. It's an open source technology for uh, creating uh, workflows. Now. In this part, we try to focus now on the feature, let's say, feature engineering part uh, of the pipeline. And then later on, we will also show uh, how the machine learning experiments uh, is supporting and how data scientists can do that with Hopsource. Now, the important, uh, let's say, the hidden cost of machine learning is that before you arrive at the point where you want to develop a machine learning model, uh, you need to do a lot of other things. So 80% of the machine learning projects uh, effort is uh, spent really on feature engineering. Well, that means extracting the features, the attributes, let's say, and then deciding which attributes you want to use and store them and manage them and share the attributes, the features across different, let's say, organizations or uh, different departments of the same organization. This considerably slows down the production and the release of models since there is a certain amount of uh, orchestration that needs to happen there and um, in order to, to achieve this, uh, this stage. So this, this uh, image is from a popular uh, paper released a few years ago by Google and it shows the, uh, the complexity of machine learning. So you can see the real machine learning part is the, uh, the rectangle in the middle, the small one with data, model, and prediction. This is where really data scientists want to focus on. But all the other things that we have shown they need to be done, need to be provided by a platform, and need to be done in order to put a model into production, etc. So it's quite a complex uh, uh, oper uh, operation, let's see. So Hopsworks simplifies that, make it simpler for the developers and data scientists to do that by having the feature store as the part where the features are managed, and the Hopsworks REST API, it's um, an API built over CTP uh, to manage the, uh, let's say, the putting a model into production and making requests to a model. So all this is managed by Hopsworks APIs to hide the complexity of all these different uh, boxes that you saw from the end users. Now, about the feature store in particular, it's quite uh, important and, uh, and recently has gained uh, a lot of uh, traction because it really uh, tries to connect two different worlds, let's say the data engineering and the data science uh, world, where data engineers work mostly with databases. They have uh, schemas on the data, and they work with different data types. So varchars, car sets, like they can have numbers, etc. 
Now, data scientists work uh, mostly with numbers so, because this is what really is used to develop the model. So the feature store really uh, bridges the, that gap between the data engineering and data scientists where data scientists can discover features and they can reuse features and share features that have been prepared and developed in the previous stage. And they don't have to do it again and again in a repetitive manner, the feature store manages that. So as we can see here, it's what I described at the top, you have all the uh, data sources and then you feed the data into the feature store and then uh, you, the data scientists at the bottom want to develop their models and then they use the feature store APIs to extract the features they want, create training and validation data sets in different file formats that they need depending on the machine learning framework that they use, TensorFlow or scikit-learn. And then they get the data from the feature store uh, with the, the simple APIs that Hopsox provides and then they can build the model. Uh, if that if the feature store did not exist, let's say, the data scientist would have to manually set up some process or do uh, the feature engineering time and time again. Uh, this was the feature store part. So now we will focus uh, on the, the machine learning experiments part, the highlighted part there. Now, Hopsox, uh, uh, as also part of the Extremis project, it provides an experiments service to the users. That means that the uh, users are interested in them when they are doing a machine learning experiment they want to know uh, over time uh, they want to go back in time and see uh, with which which code which actual usually data scientists use nowadays python programs so they want to know which python program they use to train a model the metadata of the model uh, for example we have uh, accuracy we have loss different um, evaluation metrics that uh, are related to the model and also they want to navigate they want to have a, a lineage of artifacts from uh, go from a model that was developed they want to discover easily which experiment uh, developed that model and that makes uh, Hopsox makes it trivial for them by clicking around and being able to discover the all the steps of the experiment now an experiment can be done on uh, a single machine let's say you have one gpu graphical processing unit processing unit which is typically used for machine learning, but that can, depending on the data sets, and we have very large data sets, as you saw here, that can take uh, hours, days, on, or even weeks to just to develop a single model. So what uh, we need to do is make it easy for data scientists to scale their machine learning experiments from a single host to uh, with one GPU to a single host with many GPUs, and also to multiple hosts with multiple GPUs. That significantly significantly uh, reduces the training time the, uh, for the model, and also Hopsox provides ways to automate the configuration of all these different uh, setups. Because typically a developer would need to set up configuration like IPs, like where the machines are, how to distribute the configuration around, uh, which type of distributed training to use depending on the framework. So Hopsox abstracts all this from the user with a user interface where they can uh, click through their way on setting up a machine learning experiment also on multiple GPUs and multiple servers. Now, uh, they have done that. So we went from a single machine to multiple machines, but then you want to go back and change something in your code. Let's say you want to uh, modify some of the input parameters that result in the model development. So and you want to do some uh, more interesting things like hyperparameter tuning for machine learning and ablation studies to, just to make it easier uh, because these things help data scientists with uh, model development. But this can be tedious. Uh, so there are some certain challenges there. How do you maintain different code bases for every different for every technique that you might need to use and apply? How do you know on which uh, processing framework your code will be uh, will run on will it be spark as we saw before will it be tensorflow something like this and uh, also with infrastructure like kubernetes it can be it can be uh, something like uh, jupyter notebooks so the hopsox uh, solution to that is a framework called maggie and uh, that framework uh, supports the distribution of contexts uh, of different machine learning contexts on uh, PySpark. so what happens is you have a search space that means that the data scientist can define uh, search space for their machine learning model and then asynchronously Maggie will take these we call them trials 
and run them. And then Maggi reports back all the the, the result, uh, all the results to the data scientist. So the data scientist, in the end, has a list of input parameters and evaluation metrics. And then they can decide when they are sure which which uh, metrics are good for their model. Uh, they can scale out to to more data to to the petabytes of data uh, that we saw in Extremer, because that can be costly. You don't want to develop by using all this data. Uh, it, it... Now the last part is uh, model uh, serving and monitoring. So you have your model and you want to put in production. So Hopsworks abstracts away the complexity of that. And underneath, this is what Hopsworks provides. So you can, uh, Hopsworks has a REST API where all the requests to the model go through Hopsworks being logged because you want to make sure that the, you want to be able to observe and monitor the distribution of the data as it's been sent to the model, and then you can decide when it is the best time to also retrain the model with the new data that has arrived. So Hopsource automates that so data scientists can focus only on the uh, coding part. And this is the user interface, for example, how it looks like when you want to serve uh, a model in uh, in Hopsource. Now, the last thing, as I'm running out of time as well, uh, is the um, uh, multi-tenancy. So, you can do all this in a single Hopsworks instance, but uh, when you're in an organization, you might want to, let's say, sandbox or isolate data between different departments for GDPR reasons as well. That might be so. Projects in Hopsworks uh, is an abstraction, like a, it's like a workspace. You have users uh, and data and code practically. So, you can draw some lines around users and data where you uh, isolate data from departments that they do not uh, have to have access to the data, but you can also share data if you need, but without uh, copying the data over, which is the important part. And the provenance, which we discussed before, that we provide as part of the of the platform. So to conclude, uh, Hopsworks uh, is uh, being developed also as part of Extreme Earth Project to scale uh, Earth analytics with deep learning techniques and geospatial analytics. And it is made available, uh, it is open source, and really the focus is to simplify and abstract away the complexity of managing all these things from the end user. So, thank you. And with uh, that... Okay, uh, thank you all. Uh, this is Antonis Delikianakis. Uh, I want to thank uh, David, uh, Miguel, and Theophilos. Uh, now we have a short session for uh, questions. Uh, so you can, uh, direct, you can either write them at chat, you can write them at chat, and uh, Miguel, Theophilos, and David can do best uh, to answer this. Uh, basically, you show different uh, ways of simplifying the way that you design data processing workflows, and maybe optimizing them. Uh, different ways of uh, querying in a unified ways uh, data that are of different formats and uh, stored in different places and, uh, and data locations and uh, ways that you can simplify the way of, uh, of a data analysis that want to perform uh, scalable uh, AI and machine learning uh, applications. Uh, personally, I saw many possible synergies between the, the three projects. There are many things that uh, all of them uh, do and this is why we started this uh, joint webinar so that we can exploit collaborations in the future uh, we also know many of the people in the projects so if you have questions please uh, uh, submit them at the chat with either features that are relevant to you or uh, uh, characteristics of the different components that you want to query so uh, i can start with uh, one question based on uh, uh, until I receive some questions at the at the chat. So at Infor, there is a large. Uh, we also have the case of we want to design uh, scalable uh, machine learning pipelines, and we were mostly uh, mostly interesting in doing this in a distributed and online fashion. So online data and streaming data is key to us. So I saw that both Theophilos and Miguel mentioned the, the use of techniques for querying uh, uh, streaming data from uh, Miguel and also from Theophilos uh, you had the part where you could do uh, online learning. Uh, so a question to both of you, for example, to Theophilos, uh, do you also uh, consider or plan to consider cases where the 
uh, online training is done in it, both in its distributed and online manner. And uh, I'm not sure if uh, the online part was also distributed or the distribution is just for the machine learning. And uh, for Miguel, uh, because streaming data may have a unique challenges that we see in our project as well, like for example, you don't have the statistics that you have uh, for when you do uh, batch processing where you have the raw files and you can calculate like the size of the data. Uh, are you uh, looking into ways of uh, adapting your query plan at runtime? Uh, so should I go first? Uh, okay. So if I understood the question correctly, um, then Hopsworks, the platform, provides ways, as you said, to do online, uh, let's say, tra distributed training for machine learning data, but it utilizes almost the same technologies to do the same for uh, uh, provide querying, let's say, capabilities for online data, also for streaming data, for example. It uses Apache Flink and Apache Spark for that, and Kafka for ingestion of the data, which acts as a buffer, let's say, when you ingest the data and before you manage to, to process. Then it really depends on the application and the developer how they want to utilize these technologies. Now, uh, for the feature engineering part, uh, we provide special uh, APIs to uh, get to query and get data in online or let's say a batch uh, manner, specifically to the feature store. But in general, yeah, the users can use the uh, frameworks we provide to do online um, distributed processing or queries. Okay, and uh, I can come in on the second question, which was about, uh, you know, in terms of streaming and statistics and uh, in, in, in essence, dealing with the query plan when you are actually, you're not as, as aware of the data. I mean, that's one of the reasons when we built RAW, uh, we very much started from a blank state approach where we started building a new engine. It's just because we were very much focused on this idea that you start by submitting queries and from there on, you decide how to store the data, index it, and cache it. And even in the case of a data lake, uh, we don't know that data, right? So even in the first query, we know nothing about it, right? And we've done a, a lot of, I mean, work on the research side on this, and there's still quite a bit of work to be done there uh, and many ideas that we're working on. But uh, I mean, the essential idea is that whether it will be streaming use case or even the batch use case, there's always a situation where the first time uh, you're being faced with it, you don't know about. Um, and you have to incrementally build statistics and you have to incrementally adapt your query plan. And and that's, you know, the idea is that is to make that so much part of the design of the system um, that it will be suited as well for streaming data. Of course, there are limits, right? And uh, you know, whether it's queues or situations like that, they can always happen, right? Uh, and there's always buffering, and there's techniques you can do, right? Uh, but it's one of the reasons that uh, you know we started from blank state, try not to leverage an existing engine, just because we think the approaches have to be fundamentally different. And again, if you're querying an S3 bucket, you don't know anything about it, right? So you you just have to go in and adapt as you go along. And there's aspects on that on answering that question to involve algebraic aspects that we've done more on the lab, that there are aspects that involve like code generation because when the engine is executing, it's generating code for efficiency and uh, how that code generation adapts over time. And and uh, we're basically using a JIT to some extent to, to help us on that, right? So there's many layers to that question. It's a very complex topic, but it's one of the reasons we're basically building the engine from ground up is very much to cope with that, whether it's streaming or batch, we have the same situation there. Yeah, thank you. So there's a question from Manolis Kubarakis uh, directed uh, to Miguel. So the question is, how expressive is the SQL-like query that you are using in a row? How does it compare with query languages proposed over the years for XML arrays, etc.? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's a good question, right? Like when we started, we looked, we took a deep look at that, like whether it was. I mean, of course, SQL, right? But OQL uh, for those who are familiar with it uh xml query languages right so it it is it is capable of the same it, it's as expressive as most of them right and and you'd have to go through details uh but we are very much aware of that research and uh, that was the motivation right so anything you can do in xml fxpad whatever uh oql so it's it's i think you can make it an oql family language uh for those ones who are more familiar with that research um uh, so you know 
certainly has been expressive enough for the use cases we have, right? Uh, while trying to keep it declarative, which means we can optimize it and so forth. Um, Are there any other questions? Okay, we'll uh, wait for um, a minute to see if there are more, more questions. I just want to say to thank uh, both uh, the speakers, also the coordinators of Smart Data Lake and Extreme Earth, Manolis Kubarakis and Dimitris Kutas, uh, for their willingness to uh, collaborate. Uh, there are more things that we plan to collaborate for in the future. Uh, the worst thing is to have projects that uh, work independently and uh, basically trying to uh, face the same challenges individually. Uh, we plan at some point to exchange uh, ideas and knowledge in order to accomplish uh, something bigger. And uh, also we want to thank uh, Jean Christophe and uh, Nikki for their help in organizing this webinar. And uh, I think this will be one of many webinars to come uh, between uh, these projects. Now, um, I don't see any other questions. Uh, if you, if some question comes up, you can email it to any of the speakers or to me, and uh, we'll make sure that it's answered. And uh, we may do the, uh, like have a, an answer, a reply using a video so that we can attach it to this uh, webinar uh, for all of you. So I don't see any other questions. So many thanks to David, Miguel, and Theophilos. Uh...